The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Macdonald. Senators, order, if I can please, could you have your conversations outside please? All I can hear is you talking. The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Macdonald, which is also shown in item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? That was lucky. The, the proposal is supported. I understand that the informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. It has become apparent oh, over the last few weeks that this is a Labor government of old, not of Hawke or Keating or Curtin, but of the disastrous Rudd-Gillard-Rudd days. Labor has been marred by cabinet leaks, indecision and warring cabinet ministers. And this has culminated in the latest failure, domestic gas policy. They have shot themselves in the foot and now they're complaining it hurts. Back in September, after the Jobs and Skills Summit, the Prime Minister unequivocally ruled out any thought of a new mining tax. And yet, less than two weeks ago, it was leaked that this was back on the table. Another broken promise from a broken government. It is mining tax 2.0. Labor's own budget has forecast gas and electricity price increases of over 40 per cent and 50 per cent over the next two years. And what was their solution? Well, it was to cut critical funding to projects designed to provide more gas supply. And in the October budget, they axed the Beedaloo Cooperative Drilling Program, a program designed to secure gas supply from the Beedaloo Basin, a basin that could supply over 200,000 petajoules of gas. That's 200 years' worth of supply. And in that same budget, they also slashed more than half of the funding for the Cooper Adaval Basin a plan. Over $30 million allocated to increase domestic gas supplies was gutted, further stranding investors trying to increase our domestic gas supply. And to make matters worse, Labor has showered green lawfare officers like the Environmental Defenders Office and Environmental Justice Australia with almost $10 billion in handouts. What we have is a government in crisis. Labor has no plan to address cost of living, no plan to address rising electricity prices and no plan to address rising electricity prices. All we have are thought bubbles. And furthermore, state governments that are now paying for reservations, price caps and government interventions are the same states that have locked gas away, reducing supply to the domestic market. The hypocrisy is astounding, for it will not be states like Victoria who suffer under a price cap or resources tax. It will be states like Western Australia and Queensland who already produce gas for domestic users. Yet instead of working to get more gas out of the ground to help Australian families and industries, Labor is instead laying siege to the resources sector from all sides. Mining companies are now warning that up to 33,000 jobs are at risk from a potential new mining tax 2.0 from Labor, as well as their irresponsible industrial relations legislation. That would imperil projects valued at up to 77 billion dollars, spreading investment, uncertainty and contagion. The mining sector has identified 140 projects subject to final pre-final investment decisions that would be at risk from new taxes and ill thought through industrial relations changes. And more broadly, with Labor reviewing the EPBC and creating additional barriers for approvals, there is now potentially up to $100 billion in investments and 174,000 jobs now at risk with the Environment Minister's politically charged project reviews. Now, we know that the surest way to secure affordable, reliable gas is through increasing supply. The Coalition knows this. Minister King knows this. Unfortunately, some of her cabinet colleagues cannot fathom the thought of investing in gas supply. The Coalition developed our Strategic Basins program to target projects that brought domestic gas supply online, projects in the Beedaloo, Cooper, Adavale, North Bowen and Galilee. 
And these projects were backed by industry and, with government support, had the potential to bring hundreds of petajoules of gas to market. The coalition invested over $360 million in our strategic basin plan and national gas infrastructure projects. Fund a plan funding to ensure Australian households, consumers and manufacturers have access to affordable gas. Gas is and will continue to be a necessity for decades to come through power generation, for manufacturing, industry, agriculture and energy transitions. Labor needs to stop their internal bickering and guarantee more gas supply now. Thank you, Senator. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, it is really something, isn't it, to be lectured to by the National Party, of all of the parties in this chamber, about division. Uh, it's peak Senate. We should probably offer Senator Macdonald an extension of time to talk about it more, because this is the group of people who could have done something about this or any number of things in the nine years that they were part of government. But they didn't use their nine years for that, did they? They actually just spent most of their time in government bickering with one another about who was going to get to be the DPM. That was their big priority, working out who was going to get the big position. And they didn't pay attention to the very significant policy issues that required the attention of the government, that required the attention of the National Party, that the regions would have appreciated had it been dealt with. They didn't do any of those things. They just fought amongst themselves about who was going to be the Deputy Prime Minister. The truth is that energy prices are, of course, a very real challenge for our economy. We are currently dealing with the most significant shock to energy markets in 50 years, and that is a direct result of Russia's illegal and prolonged attack on Ukraine. And the IEA says this about it. They say energy markets and policies have changed as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, not just for the time being, but for decades to come. So if you think about the context that we are dealing with, it's a pretty sad reflection on the opposition that their choice is to come in here and make a pretty narrow partisan and political point. Exactly, there is a national interest to be dealt with here and it needs to be taken seriously. Australian households, businesses and industries are grappling with the impact of this. And responding to it is made all the more difficult because of the chaos and dysfunction that afflicted the last government, particularly on the question of energy policy. And since coming to government, we've been taking steps to remedy it. So in the very first days after the Albanese Labor government ministry was sworn in, we had to deal with a very significant crisis emerging in the energy market, in the electricity market, and that was successfully navigated in a collaborative and orderly way using the institutions of the market and working with colleagues in states and territories. Since had to deal with a gas supply issue, which again we've dealt with in an orderly and collaborative way, and now we are dealing with pricing. But the truth is, Senator Macdonald likes to talk about the legacy on gas, but the Morrison government's gas-fired recovery failed to get more gas into the system. It was all talk and no action. They said they'd enforce use it or lose it conditions on gas licences, and that actually didn't happen. They said they'd develop a gas reservation scheme, and that didn't happen. They said they'd avoid a shortfall in the domestic gas market with new agreements with the three East Coast LNG exporters, but they didn't bother to extend the Australian domestic gas security mechanism or the heads of agreement before the last election. There's a lot of talk and not much delivery. We understand that this matters for Australians, and we are taking prudent, responsible and careful action to reduce energy price pressures on Australian households and on Australian industry without undermining investment. As the IEA points out, and almost any other serious commentator, these are extraordinary times. 
energy markets around the world are being reshaped, and the government is working on options to bring prices down. Greater transparency in the market is urgently needed, and the solutions lie not just in one place. It's no silver bullet. They lie across the energy supply chain. And so the ACCC is advising the Treasurer on how the gas industry's voluntary code of conduct is operating and how to ensure reasonable pricing. As the Treasurer has said, our first preference is not a tax outcome here. Our first preference is a regulatory outcome. But it makes sense to leave other options on the table until we conclude a view, and it's not wise to rule other options out. The budget contains $67 million to modernise energy market regulation and to increase the ACCC scrutiny of gas markets. And any additional action that we take on energy prices will be balanced against the need to maintain investment confidence and to support Australian Thank industry you, and Senator households. McAllister. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Fossil fuel companies in Australia are, are amongst the dodgiest polluters in the world and destroyers of First Nations cultural heritage. For decades, they have been aided by a succession of Labor and Liberal governments. Supply is not the issue here. Don't be fooled. Don't be a fossil fool. We export around 80 per cent of Australia's gas. The idea that we simply need to increase supply is a complete joke. But it's a joke that governments have adopted as energy policy over the last decade. More gas production just means even more exports and profits for oil and gas companies like Santos, Woodside and Chevron. This is a government that is captured by these fossil fuel companies, allowing them to continue destroying our lands, water, air and sacred sites, facilitating manufactured consent rather than ensuring traditional custodians providing free, prior and informed consent. Climate change is here. The climate science spells it out clearly. At the recent COP, we heard stories from First Nations people across the globe who are being displaced, leaving their ancestral homes and losing their ancestral bones because of climate change. The International Energy Agency has said itself, if we are to have any chance of sticking to 1.5 and protect our cultural heritage, there can be no new oil and gas projects. This sounds simple, right? But this government is more interested in protecting their corporate donor mates in the fossil fuel industry than taking meaningful climate action. Instead, this government gave $42.7 billion in fossil fuel handouts in their recent budget. While we are in a cost of living and climate crisis, and while First Nations people in the Beedaloo and across the country are fighting to protect their country against fossil fuel companies. Just yesterday, the Greens tried to stop the government from lending their mates in the Victorian government $32 million for a dodgy gas development on my country, Gunai country, Golden Beach pristine, beautiful country, part of the 90-mile beach. The audacity of the Victorian Labor government to talk treaty while they log our country, drill into our ocean, which destroys our lands and waters and totems and sacred thank sites. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Your time has expired. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, whenever I follow a Green senator in this place who talks about economics and supply and demand, I always refer to my book on basic economics and see what that tells me about supply and demand issues. And Senator Thorpe, Senator Thorpe seemed to think this is not a supply issue. It is absolutely a supply and demand issue. And what happens when you constrain supply, you constrain supply, prices go up. It is economics 101. When you constrain supply, prices go up. And that is what we have seen. That is what we have seen in the Australian gas market. It is basic economics 101. You constrain supply and prices go up. The tragedy, the tragedy of this situation is that Australia has ample, ample supply of gas. 
It's just a question of getting it out the ground and getting it to market. And that is where there's been a failure, a failure of, in particular, governments, the gov state government of Victoria. And in respect to that, in respect to that, in that context, in that context, it is so disappointing to hear some of the rhetoric coming, emerging from some of the government ministers on the other side of the chamber. And in particular, in particular, I talk about. Uh, I refer to the comment which was made by the industry minister, Mr. Ed Husick, which was quoted in an article written by the great political editor of the AFR, Philip Curry, entitled "Labor Unions Rupture Over Gas Prices." And I quote: "This is what Minister Husick said." It's Team Australia or Team Greed. The choice is up to the gas companies. End quote. That's what he said. That's what he said, Mr. Acting Deputy President. He cast a slur, a general slur, on, upon all of those companies, great, including great Queensland companies, in, which spend millions and millions of dollars on gas exploration, have invested in important infrastructure in places like Gladstone, in my home state of Queensland. It's all about Team Australia or Team Greed. That's what the minister says. That's what the minister says, and casts a general slur over those involved in the oil and gas industry. And I say, I say through you, Mr. Acting Deputy President, where was the Minister for Industry? Where was the Minister for Industry when those companies, when those companies were struggling with gas prices near the floor and were writing off billions of dollars in investment, incurring billions and billions in losses? Where was his Team Australia or Team Greed rhetoric? Nothing. Critics, crickets, absolutely nothing. Crickets, nothing. But now the market has turned. He wants to cast a slur on the gas companies. What he should be doing, what he should be looking at, is in particular the state government of Victoria and how it has not taken the action ne necessary to increase gas supply in the East Coast market. I want to quote from an article, uh, an op-ed piece, which was written by Mr. Ian Davies, who actually is involved in the gas industry and knows something about the gas industry. And I think this article, which appeared in the AFR uh, a month or so ago, is actually contains all you need to know about this argument. Contains all you need to know about this argument. I quote: "The key to reducing gas price is to unlock the upstream gas industry's potential to deliver more gas." End quote. That's the key. This is a supply issue. This is a supply issue. The gas is there in the ground. We need to get it to market. That's the key. That's the key. And again, I quote from this outstanding op-ed: "Simply blaming upstream gas suppliers for all of the economy's woes is not only wrong; it is cynical, political, and lazy." End quote. That's what he says. He's involved, Mr. Davies. He's involved in the gas industry and has been for a long period of time. And that's the response. That's the response to the slurs from the Minister for Industry who invokes greed, etc., etc., instead of looking at the underlying causes. And the underlying cause is a lack of, of supply. A lack of supply. The Narrabri gas project in New South Wales could provide half the market for gas for residences and businesses in New South Wales. Half the market. But it's taken 10 years and more. We're still waiting for that gas project to come online. That's the issue. It's an issue of supply. And those opposite ministers in this government are engaging in this rhetoric, which I refer to as cynical, political and lazy rhetoric, demonising the gas industry instead of looking at uh, ways in which supply can be increased. And I'll, I'll end with this quote from Mr Davies' article. We are a sophisticated and wealthy nation with sophisticated and complicated markets. Let's act like it. End quote. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. The National Party have put forward the urgency motion today. It is the same party who held the resources portfolio between 2013 and 2022 and failed to introduce a domestic gas reserve policy in Commonwealth waters. If a domestic gas reserve policy had been introduced, Australians would not be facing a shortage of natural gas or high-priced electricity. Budget Paper 1 shows Australians will receive more from beer drinkers than foreign-owned multinational companies exporting liquefied natural gas. When I introduced the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment Benefit to Australia Bill 2020 to get more natural gas for Australia, not one party supported me. 
We can only blame the parties that have formed government for the high-priced gas which has killed manufacturing in Australia and is driving electricity prices higher. I am not going to let the, natural, the Nationals virtue signal on natural gas when in government they helped foreign-owned companies avoid paying tax in Australia. If the Nationals had stopped taking $55,000 a year from oil and gas companies for corporate membership of their party, they might have been free from the criticism of conflict of interest. Australians expect their government to act in their best interest. That won't happen while the big parties take millions from oil and gas companies. And as I keep reiterating, until we deal with the gas of the northwest shelf and get these multinational companies to pay their fair share of tax in Australia here and get a gas supply from Western Australia to the east coast of Australia or build more pipelines to service the needs of Australians, we are going to lose more industries, more manufacturing because of the loss of gas. This has been ill thought out and ill prepared by governments who have not fought for the benefits of the Australian people. And it's an absolute crying shame that they never supported my bill, the Offshore Petroleum Gas Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment Benefits Bill in the best interest of all Australians. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, first, I just, just wanted to briefly respond to Senator Hanson there. It is not correct to say that the, the former Liberal Nationals government uh, did not uh, impose a domestic gas reservation policy. Uh, one of the last acts I did as a Resources Minister was to, uh, was to establish uh, a a change in policy of the federal government that any new gas field developed in Australia would have a domestic reserve requirement. Uh, stand by that decision, and we very much hope that some of these new gas fields are developed to help supply gas to Australians. In terms of comments Senator Hanson made about offshore uh, oil and gas fields, we only really have a couple of those in Australia, some off west the Western Australian coast and some off the Victorian coast, with a little bit up in Northern Territory. The reality is those in the west and the north are not connected uh, to the eastern coast, and there is not a shortage of gas in our north and west, so an off offshore reservation policy there would not have alleviate, alleviated the situation we face here in eastern Australia. And that being as it said, in Western Australia there already is a 15 per cent domestic gas reserve requirement, uh, which supplies them with gas uh, properly so. Uh, in the Bass Strait, the other, the other big resource we have, all of that is supplied domestically. The Bass Strait resort already reserve already does go to domestic sources. Uh, a domestic gas res reservation requirement would not have changed that. The problem we have as a nation and have faced for some years is that the Bass Strait as a region has been declining in terms of its gas uh, reserves, especially low-cost gas, which comes when you produce oil. That has increased prices and costs uh, for the users of gas in eastern Australia. And we have been desperate to find new sources of gas. Of course, we have the coal seam gas in Queensland, which helps, but it is a relatively high-cost form of gas production, and what we desperately need is to find more oil. Uh, that is why the decision in the budget only a few weeks ago to slash funding for the development and exploration of new gas fields is so disappointing uh, to the manufacturing industry in this, in this country, to anyone who wants to support and see uh, power bills, energy bills come down in Australia. Effectively, this government is crying crocodile tears for the manufacturing industry right now. Uh, they, are, they are purporting to have sympathy. Uh, uh, for, the, for the factory owners, uh, for, for small businesses, for just mums and dads who are struggling to pay their bills right now. But on the other hand, they're doing nothing uh, uh, with, with the actions they could take to alleviate those circumstances. If the government was serious about bringing down gas prices in making sure we keep manufacturing jobs in this country, why would they cut over $50 million to the development of the Cooper and Attervale basins uh, to develop more gas for Australians? The truth is Australian governments have always been involved in the development of new oil and gas fields in this country. In the Bass Strait, it was the Menzies government at the time that provided a production credit, a drilling credit, uh, to uh, then uh, uh, BHP and SO. Uh, to develop that field, and it served Australia well for 50 years. Because drilling for new oil and gas fields is extremely risky, mm -hmm. uh, at the early stages of the de development it is very hard to make the sums stack up, even more so when you have a government uh, calling in 18 coal and gas projects right now, so the risks of paying up lots of money, hundreds of millions of dollars up front to drill, and you don't even know if you're going to get approval at the end of it, make it very, very difficult. So there is a public good in developing our own resources. Because let's be clear, the gas companies, I agree with Senator Hanson, the gas companies don't own the resource, it's owned by the Australian people. And so because it's owned by ourselves, we should seek to develop 
the knowledge and understanding of those resources so that we can attract further investment uh, from companies uh, to develop them. It is our resource. It's like owning a block of land. When you own a block of land, you try and market it. You want someone to buy it. You might, you might fence it. You might put some fences around it. You might do some stick picking on it to make some buyers interested in coming along and potentially developing it. Same principle here. It is our oil and gas. It is our resources. We should be doing that early work, that exploratory drilling, to bring up, to de-risk those projects, to bring up the knowledge of it, so that we can attract investment and bring down power bills and keep manufacturing jobs in this country. The government's decision to slash funding uh, from those, those activities is so short-sighted and it is so hypocritical. Because we have the Treasurer out there today saying that somehow he wants to find a solution for the manufacturers and gas industry of this country, yet in his budget only a month ago he slashed the very funding of development of resources that we could help uh, alleviate those resources. If only, only we, our factories could be, could be powered by the hypocrisy of this government, we would never have another problem we'd solve climate change. There's an infinite supply of hypocrisy from those opposite, but we can't bottle wishful thinking and help it to protect jobs in this country. We actually have to get our hands dirty and drill and support those people who work hard for our nation to develop our country. That's why we supported the gas industry when we were in government. I just wish this one would do the same. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Brockman. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to speak on this matter of urgency, and I'm very happy to follow my, my colleagues, Senators Scar and Canavan, on the matter of gas policy in this country. And I think it's very important, uh, just following on from Senator Canavan in particular, to pick up on his point that we have two very different gas markets in Australia. We have an eastern, gas, uh, eastern states gas market, which is currently facing extraordinary cost pressures, but we also have a Western Australian gas market, a gas market in Western Australia that has been described recently in a major uh, a newspaper as providing Western Australia a low energy paradise. Um, and Western Australians are the largest gas consumers of any Australians. Now, did these things happen as a result of accident? No. And as you would know very well, Mr Acting Deputy President, they happened as a result of government policy led by Sir Charles Court of the Liberal Party. In fact, Rather than the current gas reservations policy, um, it was the take or pay agreement that Sir Charles Court put in place with the North West Shelf project that actually enabled Western Australia to develop uh, the situation it currently has, where it has internationally recognised low gas prices, um, sufficient supply to meet industry demands. I, I would like to see that industry demand increase in actual fact. I would like to see more growth in Western Australia as a result of our uh, very cost-effective gas prices. But not only did that gas policy provide West Australia with a very solid foundation of its own energy supply system, but it also meant that we could supply our major trading partners and allies with a very important uh, export commodity. Japan, a nation recognised largely, uh, widely, as a, a, a positive environmental uh, advocate internationally, is our largest importer of LNG from Western Australia. Some 48 per cent of LNG from Western Australia actually goes to Japan. Uh, again, uh, Japan is widely seen as having very strong environmental credentials. But not only do we export to Japan, we are other also export to other very important uh, trading partners—South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, China, India. L uh, West Australian LNG quite literally powers the world, and that is a very positive thing. Uh, these projects don't come at no cost. These projects require significant, significant uh, investment up front for returns that may come decades down the line. Uh, Scarborough, uh, uh, the Scarborough project in Western Australia has a cost of some $12 billion. Uh, now, that money needs to be invested, decided upon and invested long, long before any return from that investment is forthcoming. And we have a situation on the East Coast 
We have on the West Coast, we've seen those investments flow over a consistent period of time, thanks to good government policy, starting with Sir Charles Court. On the East Coast, sadly, we can't say that has been the case. As Senator Scar and Canavan pointed out, an underinvestment, particularly in a state like Victoria, in fact, not a, you can't even call it an underinvestment because it's been a regulatory block. It's been governments refusing to allow business to unlock the resources that do exist that has seen this current situation where we have a massive spike in gas prices. And I think the greatest irony then is when we see this government flailing around, what solutions has it actually managed to come up with? Well, it's come up with no solutions. It's come up with a few thought bubbles that really puzzle me. Price caps? As Senator Scar said, when have price caps ever solved a supply problem? I mean, never. And there's 2,000 years plus of history to demonstrate that point. What other solutions have they come up with? A new mining tax? A new tax on gas companies? I mean, do they really see that as being a solution to a price problem on the East Coast? And thirdly, they've come up with a regulatory fix. Well, safe to say, I don't think anyone on this side in this place has any faith in this government coming up with a sensible regulatory fix. Thank you, Senator Brockman. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Macdonald be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against no. no. I think the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved <coughs> by Senator Donald uh, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Cadell as seller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as seller for the noes. Order, there being 26 ayes and 35 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative.